Thank you, Axel, for this, uh, this uh, challenge. Um, uh, as you can tell, Axel and I pretty much agree on everything we, we do in the field, so I'm, I'm trying to defend my side. I'll do the best I can. Uh, so the question is the role for adjuvant oxaliplatin in rectal cancer. All the slides are virtually the same. It's just a matter of how you spin them. Uh, I actually had, a, early in my career, my, one of my, uh, the chief of my division was Craig Henderson, who's a breast cancer uh, expert. And I remember he and I went to meetings consecutively on separate days, giving talks in a different places. We just, just so happened to be on the same rubber chicken circuit. And, uh, and Dr. Henderson spoke about both sides of an issue in breast cancer, hormonal therapy, and use the same slides to argue opposite sides of the question on consecutive days. It's all a matter of how you look at the data and what biases you bring to the table. So I will bring my biases to the table to contradict what Dr. Grothy just said. So the, the, clearly, as you've seen from other presentations, the, the, the seminal and most impressive, paper, I think, result we've seen in rectal cancer came from Sauer et al. This is the, the randomized study that, that established neoadjuvant chemoradiation as our standard. This was extraordinarily well done in an era when the U.S. and the cooperative groups tried to, uh, multiple times to do studies and failed. They did so in Germany, and you see the, uh, the outcomes there. Now, uh, I'm looking, at least I don't see uh, anything, anything on here that says oxal. Oh, there, there, that would be oxaliplatin, where it included, and that would be oxaliplatin. So, in fact, this, of course, included only 5-FU and bolus 5-FU at that. Uh, as uh, as uh, I term the, this is the Mayo 5-FU, which Axel already preempted me by saying, rule number one in drug development, take an, a standard, a standard regimen and use it as your comparator, especially if it's toxic and not very effective. And that's the role that Mayo played for, for a number of years. So uh, oxaliplatin in either of these settings, uh, is that appropriate? Well. Uh, as Axel referred to NSABPR04, it certainly wasn't appropriate in this study, which was stopped early for, uh, or, or was actually, uh, I'm sorry, it was not, it was stopped, or the results ultimately, if you look at the bottom, I, I'm sorry, actually the results, I can't really see from here, but the results show clearly detriment in terms of toxicity with oxaliplatin with no benefit as a neoadjuvant. Now, Dr. Grothy quickly dismissed that as not having a role and uh, I, that I agree with. Uh, now, this unfortunately, this animation failed. I don't know why it's failing on this one, but this, the list of, of the studies here are the same list that Axel just showed before with, with Accord, Star01, Petoc, and, and another one tucked in. And this was accompanied by a very well-written editorial by Dr. Marty Weiser, who's here somewhere in the audience. And Dr. Weiser, with neoadjuvant oxaliplatin, says, the title of his talk was Rectal Cancer Trials, No Movement, uh, and a little bit of pun there. Uh, but it was, there was more toxicity and no change in path CR. So I think we'll, we'll take that off the table as a neoadjuvant. The question is, what about the adjuvant setting? And this is the classic mosaic results that lead, led to our usage of oxaliplatin in the adjuvant setting. Uh, really very sm little benefit to, the, uh, to stage two generically, but substantial benefit to stage three. Uh, here are the studies that have been done that would more or less address the value of oxaliplatin as a post-operative therapy. Uh, and you see them listed here. And let me first talk about the trial that Axel cited as indeed the, the outlier trial, which is a door. Uh, the outlier trial is shown here, this small, very small, what was this? This is 300 patient study that compared post-operative 5-FU leucovorin versus Folfox. Uh, and this study uh, does show a benefit to Folfox. Uh, the disease-free survival was, uh, was just reached that 0 .047. That's just a little bit less than 0 .05. So it sort of suggests a trend towards improvement. Uh, but those are the results. Again, this was in Lancet Oncology uh, last year. And I would emphasize that this is the outlier and again, the rule of thumb, uh, which is uh, you, you need to look at the data set in its entirety, not at a small, underpowered study, even though by a reputable group. Now, uh, what about EORTC 
uh, 22921, again, as Axel categorizes, this is an astonishing story. This is a study that keeps on giving publications. It was started in 1993, and now 22 years later, we're seeing follow-ups. It's remarkable. This is uh, a, a clinical stage two or three rectal cancer, two by two factorial design, and power to demonstrate a 10% difference in overall survival benefit. Uh, it, it, I think it's worth looking historically at the results. Uh, 10 years ago, Bosset, who I believe is a radiation oncologist, is that right, Chris? Is Bosset a radiation oncologist? So th this is uh, in, in a French radiation oncologist, showed a benefit to local control with chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, it, it, they, it's interesting to look at how they represent data separate in different eras. Uh, in 2006, in the New England Journal, we saw progression-free survival. And the curves look about the same for disease-free survival eight years later. And in fact, though, when we looked at the role of chemotherapy uh, in general in this disease, we see very not clear that chemotherapy was of much benefit. Uh, the overall survival is shown here with this study, which uh, arguably raises the issue of whether we should do chemotherapy at all in this disease, let alone oxaliplatin-based chemotherapy. Now, uh, again, whether this is accurate or not, this is a different era with different uh, radiation delivered in a different way than we currently use. And again, uh, this, was, uh, this is a baseline to, to raise the question, should we be doing chemotherapy at all? I think the, the problem with these studies that look at post-operative adjuvant generically is the per percentage of patients who don't get back-end chemotherapy. As you see here uh, over time, we're stuck at fully uh, 35 or 40 percent of patients who never get the full post-operative adjuvant therapy following neoadjuvant chemoradiation. So if it were to be effective, I think we'd have trouble measuring it, but at least uh, to my mind, it's not clear that both that oxaliplatin in particularly that noxious toxic combination therapy causes neuropathy, life-limiting effects. Not sure it's uh, worth doing based on this data. Now to the guidelines, um, and, and we didn't rehearse this actually, but to the guidelines, this is the before Axel Grothy era. This is 2009, when I in fact was the vice chair of the, of the committee for the NCCN guidelines, but Mayo was not a member of NCCN. Uh, now let me show you the current guidelines in 2015. Mayo is now a member of NCCN, uh, and you see now Folfox mysteriously appears uh, in the print here. And in fact, uh, this is category 2A data. Category 2A means somebody has an idea. They think, you know, it's a consensus. Nobody's going to argue with the guy. So, 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 and this is what category 2A is. Based upon lower level evidence, there is uniform NCCN consensus that the intervention is appropriate and we don't want to make a tough time for the new guy on the block. Uh, and so this is now how it looks. This is, you see in red, these are all the changes since Mayo joined NCCN, and in fact, uh, the, now the, I will say there is one problem with my argument, and that is the study I think is the most important study we're doing now in the field, as Deb Schrag's study that we heard about earlier, the most important, it's a paradigm changing study, and we use Folfox there, but that's Folfox in the un it, potentially to spare radiation. So I do think in that setting it may be appropriate, I, I think it is appropriate, it's accruing incredibly well. Another plug for a really important study that is moving along remarkably uh, towards uh, perhaps defining a new treatment. So in this setting, I do agree that full fox is appropriate, and uh, so I wouldn't make a blanket statement. But I remind you, if you look there uh, on the on the roster there, you'll note that Axel Grothy's name is over there on the le on your right hand side. That's the change between 2009 and 2015, and that's why we now have full fox as part of the. Uh, guidelines. Thank you for your attention.